Who would like to be more confident? Great, show of hands, I didn't expect that. I would, I would like to be more confident. I'd like to be even more confident to speak in public, like this. More confident to negotiate. More confident, perhaps, to get myself a better deal on the next car that I'm looking for, and on my next property purchase. Now, I'm here to tell you that if you, if you would really, if you are interested in being more confident, it's not actually that complex. It's pretty simple. Okay, it's not easy, but it is simple. And I think that it's illustrated with my coffee shop story, which I am going to tell you. <laughs> but first of all, Thor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sorry? Is that really your name? Is that short for something? Is that your stage name? Are you a stripper? <laughs> now, you would think, wouldn't you, being called Thor, that I would be automatically confident. You might think that. But here's the thing. What I find is that people, before they meet me, they kind of expect that I'm going to be this six foot two, long blonde hair, blue eyes. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> they expect me to be this impressive Viking, and then I show up. And there's always a kind of a vague whiff of disappointment in the air, I think. Or, or even a touch of humor. And the example I love to quote happened to be last year in Houston, and uh, the border guard, she took my passport and she looked at it. She me. She says, Sir, you know they made a movie about you? <laughs> yeah, she laughed too. <laughs> so, the name comes from my unusual upbringing, which we will get to. But my, my dad, bless him, he thought that my name was going to help me to fit in in what you can only, <laughs> what you can only describe as Viking-infused Shetland, okay? <laughs> so, and here's how well it worked. My best buddies at school, Martin, Alan, and Stuart. So thanks, Dad, thanks for trying, but that didn't help me fit in. <laughs> But my parents, well, let me, I'll, I'll get to the unusual upbringing bit, because you need to hear the rest of that, I think. We didn't realize it was unusual, okay? Myself and my two brothers, we didn't know it was unusual. But when you go around to your friend's house, and they have electricity, <laughs> and they have running water, then you realize that what you're being brought up with maybe isn't quite the norm. Because my parents, loving, inspirational, amazing people, but they were hippies at the time. And they'd moved up to Shetland from England, and they've moved specifically to a tiny little island called Papastua, which I hope you're all going to Google search after this. And Papastua is, really is small, three miles by two miles, with, I guess at the time, maybe 35, 40 odd people there. And when I say odd, I really do mean there were some, <laughs> only some, some odd people there. My favorite memory, I was maybe five or six, and I was on the ferry boat, a little 24 foot long boat. I was on this boat on the way over to the island with my, I called her mummy then. So for the sake of this example, we'll call her Mummy. So I'm with Mummy, and there's this guy crawling around the deck of the boat. And he's, ruff, ruff, he's barking like a dog. So I looked up at my mum for some guidance in this situation, and she just said, don't worry, darling, he's a punk rocker. <laughs> yes, she is posh, my mum. So it was an incredible upbringing, a very, very free physical upbringing. I had my own boat when I was four years old, which I'd actually saved up with my brother. We collected shellfish and sold them and bought this boat. We had it built. So I was four years old and I used to set to sea in this thing. Now, I didn't learn to swim until I was eight. <laughs> we were allowed to go cliff climbing, completely unsupervised, like 1,800 foot cliffs, no equipment. I'm sure Nikki wouldn't be impressed with this. We had access to guns, motorbikes, tractors. It was fantastic. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that sadly they would be arrested if they brought up kids like that these days. But with all that physical freedom, something was missing. What well, was for me? Now, I'm, I'm no psychologist, so I'm not trying to kind of piece together why it turned out the way it did. But as a friend of mine said to me, he was, he was very honest with me after university, and he said, Thor, and I won't name him in case he watches this, he said, Thor, you know, when you were at school, you were a bit of a social invertebrate, weren't you? 
In other words, no social bones at all. And I just thought it was a lovely expression, a social invertebrate. So I had a, re I had a real challenge around people, interacting with people. I, was, I had a very low confidence level. But like many of us here in Scotland, we mask it. And I chose to mask it with alcohol. And the first time I did this, this is young even for Scotland, I was nine years old. And I can still remember being at this family party and sneaking in and stealing, basically, because nobody knew I was taking it, stealing this homemade wine. Sorry, Mum and Dad, if you're watching this. And I remember that numbing feeling, and it's, like a, it's kind of like a confidence feeling, isn't it? But it's kind of fake confidence. So I guess I could subtitle this talk, What I Wish I'd Known When I Was Nine. I've got a question for you all now. You don't have to answer it, you can just think it. Or you can put your hand up. I like that show of hands, that was good. Who here is afraid of flying? Got one honest person down the front. Great, okay. Well, I've got a question for the rest of you, and that is, I do a lot of flying, right? And what I've noticed is, all you confident flyers, your conversations seem to end about five minutes before touchdown, especially when it's really turbulent. What a coincidence, eh? So no, of course the rest of you aren't afraid of flying. No, I totally get it. Yeah, what you maybe need to try is my perspe uh, perspective shifting experience I had when I was 21. I was up in an airplane, I won't name the pilot, but it was a little airplane, and I was at the controls, and we were flying over the hills out towards Bankery, and the engine stopped. It ran out of fuel. And that is a perspective shift on flying, I can tell you. <laughs> what year was it? It was 2003, I think, but for some reason all the security rules haven't quite cut in. You know, the ones where pilots get their nail files and extra bananas confiscated. Those kind of rules haven't cut in. I was in the cockpit of a Boeing 747 flying down to Turkey. Uh, just for the camera, Ted, there are other airline manufacturers. I'm not pitching Boeing, okay? I was in the cockpit of this Boeing 747. So we had an engineer, two pilots, and me, this really nervous, scared flyer. We're coming at the land through the mountains. I don't know if we've beat the Dalaman in Turkey, but it's kind of a mountainous approach. And I was really nervous, and I was breathing really deep. I've got big lungs because I hill run. And <laughs> The pilot, the captain, Pete, was going, what the hell's going on? And he's looking at the instruments, and I'm starting to freak out, thinking, well, what is going on? And there was liquid dripping down over the instruments, and down, liquid coming down the wind screen. So he was mopping up, and I won't say the language that he used, but he was like, what the hell's going on, basically? And he was cleaning this up. <laughs> and after we landed, I confessed to him that I thought it was probably me and my deep breathing. And I told him that I was terrified of flying. And we worked out, actually, it probably was me, because on the return leg, I was in the cockpit, and it happened again, and they said they'd literally never seen this before. But he, he said something to me that stuck with me. He said, Thor, don't worry about being afraid of flying. He said, it's not a, it's not a natural place to be, six miles up in the air. He said, when I'm in the back of a big jet, he said, I'm uncomfortable. I do not like it. He said, you're right to be respectful of flying. And that really helped me. You're right to be respectful of flying. Now, speaking of flying, I just landed this afternoon from Denver, and I was over in the US working with some oil and gas leaders on a presentation project, uh, project partly around confidence to present. But it hasn't always been that way, as you may have guessed. And I certainly haven't always been confident enough to get up here and speak to a room full of people. That is for sure. I still remember actually the first time that I was invited to deliver what I guess was an after dinner speech. And it was at a petroleum club, so there were going to be some kind of high flyers there. And at the time, they sold it to me as a really great opportunity. You can go there and you can basically pitch your business and you just have to say some entertaining things and it's going to be fine. And I was in my late 20s and I'd never presented at all. I'd never stood up and spoken in public at all. So I'm the kind of guy that likes to volunteer for things. I said, that'd be fine, yeah, I'd love to do that. And as the, as the evening approached, I realized that I was a little perturbed. And by the actual day, I was 100% nervous, I'll admit it. And then in the car, on the way to the venue, now this truly went through my brain, and I'm not proud of it, but I started wondering and trying to work out what speed I would need to be going to veer my 
car off the road and hit the trees. Really. To hospitalize myself. Now, obviously, I didn't want to terribly injure myself. Just like a sprain or something would have been nice. <laughs> but what I really didn't want was to get up on stage and present my thoughts. Present myself for the judgment that we all know we're going to get when we're up here presenting. And I accept it today. There's going to be some of you that enjoy what I do or any of the presenters do, and some of you that don't. But there is definitely a sense of judgment. But what I've come to realize over the years is that it's not a natural place to be. Now, it's not six miles up, but it's not a natural place to be. All these eyes looking at you when you're presenting. It kind of brings the, like the caveman fight or flight response as if there's this load of wild animals looking at you, it's really a bit surreal. And there's something else about it, which you guys are demonstrating beautifully right now because you're totally silent, thank you. And that is the unwritten kind of agreement that we have, that I get to talk and say my thoughts, and you all listen. It's amazing. I mean, hundreds of people are listening, and you're getting to say what you want to say about something that you care about. That is leverage. And that is a privilege, and I personally don't take that privilege lightly. So I'll quote Pete, the Canadian captain of that 747, and say that I should be, and we should be rightfully respectful of speaking in public. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, same as flying. But we, should, we definitely should be rightfully respectful of this position. How many of you present regularly or negotiate those kind of things? Anyone do it regularly? A couple of hands, a few hands. Cool. Because what I've found, even at quite a high level in businesses, it's actually pretty rare that we have an opportunity to present or to negotiate in real terms really often. <coughs> so this is where my coffee shop story comes in. So I was in Glasgow, maybe a month ago now, I was with a business partner of mine in one of my ventures, a guy called Dave, and we would be up since four in the morning, so we're tired, and we'd had a meeting with lawyers, so we really needed a break. And so we went into Pret-a-Manger. There are other coffee shops, of course. <laughs> in fact, there was a Costa coffee across the street. We chose Pret, and we went in, hey, how are you doing? She said, great. So the first thing we did there that might be a little different is we waited for her to reply instead of saying, how are you doing? Two coffees, please. So we put our porridge down, good low GI breakfast to get us going, and Dave ordered the two coffees. And I chipped in with, and could we have a discount on these coffees, please? Because we chose your coffee shop over Costa Coffee across the street. <laughs> and there's a silence. And she goes, um, she starts laughing, she goes, uh, do you know what I can do? I can give you these two coffees for free. And Dave couldn't quite believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but I could, because it's happened many, many times. Because I do this every single day. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm here, I'm here to suggest I'm not here to tell you anything, but I'm here to suggest that there's no such thing as a naturally born, confident public speaker or presenter. Same as there's no such thing as a naturally born, confident negotiator, a naturally born, confident flyer. As far as I know, even birds have to learn and practice. Now, my brother's an airline pilot, so you might now guess who was in that small plane earlier. <laughs> but he took a couple of years of really hard work to become a confident, confident pilot. And let me ask you this question. If you heard that your pilot flying you down to London from Aberdeen was just a naturally fantastic, confident pilot. He's just such a good guy. He doesn't need to go and do simulator checks or training. How quick would you be getting off that plane? Because <laughs> we kind of know this deep down, don't we? If we want to be confident or competent at anything, we've got to do the work, and that's a choice. We've got to choose confidence over fear, choose confidence over lack of confidence. Little side note to that coffee shop story. I say I do it every day. I mean, every time I get an opportunity, my poor wife, I do it in Tesco. I do it everywhere. But the point about it is, it's not to actually get the discount. When you get a discount, that's great. That's an extra bit of icing on the cake. 
The point about it is to put yourself in a slightly awkward social situation to, to, to still have it be fun, though, for both parties. There's only one time in all the time I've been doing this that I felt the other person was genuinely uncomfortable, discomforted. So I just knocked on the head and paid straight away. So the idea is it's about the trying. It's about the regular practice. And it's the same whether you want to be a more confident presenter, whether you want to be more confident and competent as a negotiator, whatever. Mm. So my final suggestion for you is that you do make that choice, weekly, daily, hourly, to do what is hard work, to choose confidence over fear, and order yourself a double shot of coffee shop confidence. But just remember to ask for your discount. And if you want a because reason, because you should always use a because, by the way, because the human being is basically good, despite what some organized religions will tell you. You want to help each other. You just need to be given a reason why. And that word because, read Cialdini if you want to know why scientifically, but that word because gives that person or those people a reason to help you. And the next little key bit is what I call the gap. Thank you for demonstrating it beautifully. The gap is just listening. So you listen and let them tell you how they're going to help you. So the lady in that coffee shop in Glasgow decided she would help us with free coffees. When I did it in Starbucks in Sheridan, Wyoming yesterday, the guy said he couldn't give me free coffees, but he could give me four vouchers for free coffees. <laughs> <laughs> four free coffees. <laughs> Choose coffee shop confidence. Thank you.